So Suzanne, d does this kind of these, this question that I guess what's often called the mind body problem, you know, it's sort of trying mm -hmm. to reconcile, you know, what's happening in the brain and sort of, mm -hmm. you know, how, how does that connect to, you know, the mind? Do you think about that kind of stuff in, in what you do in your, your clinical practice in neurology? Yeah, I suppose I do think about it, but I think about it with frustration, if anything, because I think that, you know, again, it's sort of we're desperately trying to map this kind of connectome, understand how everything connects to everything else. Um, but it's, you know, what we have is a lot of people whose brains aren't working and we ex to extrapolate from that sort of how we do normal things to how we um, how we manage a situation when it isn't working just seems like there's miles between those two things. So I think mm -hmm. that neuroscience, it's just been unbelievably exciting in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. But I'm at the coal face right, right. and I sort of feel slightly, and I think that's why I'm a bit more pessimistic, mm -hmm. is I'm at the coal face and these things are all really fascinating and I think that people sometimes get the impression that well, now I can go to my doctor and, and my doctor will do an MRI scan and then they'll know what's wrong with me. Um, but it's just so not like that. Um, it, and I guess, so I guess I think it's clearly um, very exciting. Mm -hmm. right. um, but I personally, for my patients, am not feeling the benefit of it yet. Okay. So I suppose I feel a bit pessimistic in that sense. But, so, but I guess, the, I mean, the larger question is, is there a biological substrate to everything that happens in the mind, to those brain disorders that, that you are dealing with. I mean, if we were sophisticated enough, you know, if we can drill down far enough, are we going to be able to find the underlying physical cause? I believe that we can. Um, and I believe there is a bi biological substrate for consciousness. I don't want to get into talking about consciousness because I'm terrified of what mistake I'll make. <laughs> but um, basically, I do believe these things all have a biological substrate. And I think we're already at the point where we can start demonstrating biological differences in the brains. So I've been talking about people who have things like paralysis, for example. Their legs, there should be no reason that they can't move their legs. The pathways are intact. You can demonstrate that they're intact, but their perception is that they cannot move their legs and that becomes a reality. What we can do now with some of these sort of more high-tech investigations is we can show differences in the ways that these people's brains are connected than people who are perfectly well or, very importantly, people who are pretending to be paralyzed. Because if we're talking about reality, the big problem for my patients is that um, people believe that if you, if I say that everything is working fine and you can move your legs and you tell me you can't move your legs, that's because you're not really paralyzed. What we can do now is quite clearly show that there's some substrate in the brain that shows increased connectivity between the emotional part of the brain and, say, the movement part of the brain in people who have these sort of psychosomatic paralysis problems. It doesn't it doesn't prove anything at this point. It shows the difference. It shows that there is a substrate, that there's something happening differently in people's brains who have these disorders. C can you explain that? So why would sort of this emotional part of the brain, this emotional response, trigger this feeling that you are paralyzed? Well, I think, why wouldn't it? Um, because, you know, from... I don't want to get Freudian because that's not the, my take on it, but I still have to think there's some quite interesting quotes in, in studies in hysteria where this was discussed. And in studies in hysteria, they say, um, you know, if an idea can trigger a movement, then why shouldn't an idea prevent a movement? I haven't quoted that exactly correctly. But yes, if an idea is what makes you move, then why is it not possible that if you believe you can't move, that you can't move? We've all stood on the edge of a diving board or something equivalent and tried to force ourselves to jump and found ourselves paralyzed and unable to do so. If you start thinking now about walking, we walk automatically, movements are automatic. And um, we don't think about them at all. The minute you start thinking about them, they change. Nothing, nothing was as bad for my tennis swing than when someone tried to change <laughs> my grip. Right. You know, suddenly my arm, I'm aware of everywhere it is in space. And, um, you know, so th the fact that an idea can change your movements or even stop you moving, I don't think that's unusual at all. It's unusual, obviously, for it to get to the extreme that you can't move at all. Not as, un as unusual as you would think. But it's so interesting because, I mean, our operating assumption is that 
the brain is what generates our our mental experience, right? Mm. And you're saying it works the other way too. Well, the problem is that the brain cannot be trusted. Um, that's the thing. We, you know, we we are we do not have control over everything as much control over everything that's happening in here as we think we do. Um, you know, there's much more kind of top-down processing happening than, you know, 50 years ago or mid-20th century. We thought everything was just, you know, we're recording like a video recorder or taking pictures like a camera. Um, we now know that's completely wrong. Things are coming in and then they're being processed from up here so that we're constantly altering our experience of the world. And we're all doing that slightly differently. Um, so I think that that's what people kind of don't realize, um, how much impact I have on my experience of the world. But the minute you start thinking about it, it's so obvious. You know, what to, you know if you're in a room and your sort of ex-boyfriend comes in with his new girlfriend over there, that's all you can hear. No one else can hear that because that's not the thing that's interesting them. So we're, you know, in, I think physiologically, there's examples of these sort of um, ways that we're altering our own experience of the world or around us all the time. And we only become aware of them when we really think about them.